All right. Fuck. What's up? We're doing it. We're doing it. This is exciting. So for for podcasts, I like to start with a little bit of an unconventional topic to, to get us out of autopilot mode. What I was thinking would be good to start with today is combo. And that is a topic that I know pretty much nothing about other than what you've told me, what I've done research on. And we had a well, we had a long discussion about it over the phone. So, for most people listening to this, you probably don't know what combo is. So, I thought a good way to start before we get into your actual experience with it, yeah, would be just to lay out what combo is and how you got introduced to it. Right out the gate. Right out the gate. You know, wow, uh, awesome question. Combo is also known as Sapo, S A P O. Combo spelled K A M B O. And it is a uh, compound or derivative from a frog found in the Amazonian basin called the Phyllomedusa bicolor, the waxy monkey leaf frog. And um, this frog, when it's threatened or as a defense mechanism, it excretes a substance that is incredibly biodiverse and very uh, powerful in its medicinal purposes. Um, tribes, tribes, men and women have been using this for you know, millennium in the Amazonian basin. And they used, uh, it's used traditionally for a number of reasons, um, to rid the spirit and the, the body of Panema, which is in, in South American cultures, uh, the kind of bad vibes or, uh, bad energy that collects around vital organs and mm-hmm. manifests itself as anxiety, depression, anger, frustration, whatever it may be. Uh, it also helps hunters, and that's again the traditional sense of that or use of that is with hunting in order to uh, hone and sharpen the senses, in order to clear toxins, in order to uh, it says to mask human scent even. And so you know you could see why those would be good things to to mm-hmm. have in as, the a hunter, yeah, yeah. as a hunter. As a hunter, it also you know the primary purpose is is uh, I believe to boost immunity. I mean, imagine like running through the jungle and having all the th- things that can bite you or scratch you or get infected or whatever it is. Um, but it's a, it's an incredible substance that I think is a very benevolent substance that, that you can get out of it what what you seek from it. Um, it is applied subcutaneously. So you have to basically absorb this through a, a entry point or burn on the skin. So they use a very thin, uh, hot burning, fast burning vine called a Tamishi vine. Mm-hmm. And it's about the width of the head of a pencil, or I guess the, the eraser of a pencil rather. And you make a small, you know, burn. The first couple layers come out that accesses the capillaries, a couple capillary heads on, uh, in, in your body and the, the substance is applied. It's a powder or a, uh, a substance that kind of gets scraped off mixed with saliva or water mm-hmm. enters your bloodstream. And you know, it's not an, it's not an hallucinogen. It, in fact, it sucks. It's a, it's, yeah. it's a purging substance, uh, but it's quick. So what, when you go into a combo experience, because I know you've, you've done it with other people and walk them through it and you've also done it yourself. What would you walk into it with your intention trying to get out of it? Because yeah. a lot of people, including myself, when we were talking about it for the first time, I was like, damn, this sounds like I'm becoming a fucking werewolf or something. <laughs> like I have something dug into my skin and then like this shit starts moving around inside me and like I'm purging all these demons and stuff like that. And if you don't know a lot about it, you might think that that sounds crazy. What the fuck? Like, why would you ever do that to sure. yourself? So yeah, for when course. you go into it, what what's your intention behind a combo experience? Well, actually, Zach, that was my first thought initially. When my buddy told me about this, I was like, you're a fucking idiot. This is yeah. the dumbest <laughs> shit I've ever heard in my life. And, <laughs> you know, I wonder how many viewer or listeners we lost in the first five minutes. They're with they're, combo. What the fuck? They're with but, us. Uh, yeah. Hell yeah. Rad. Um, so if, if you stay, you'll learn that it, it is something that, and well, what I learned anyway, is that um, it is, it's a substance that, that is not to be taken lightly. And if you take it seriously and you go into it for a medicinal purpose, you can get a lot out of it. And, and, you know, setting those intentions beforehand, 
um, you know, I've gone in there with, or gone into a ceremony where I was participating in it, you know, receiving the medicine with the intention to clear out past emotional trauma, um, you know, specific to a event or a person, right? Uh, I've gone into it hoping to, uh, or, or looking to boost my immune system for, you know, the environment we're in now with the pandemic. Um, I've went into it looking to heal my back and then shed some of the limitations I had from a back injury. You know, I did a three mm-hmm. day in a row, it's called a dieta, yeah. uh, three days, uh, back to back to back. And, and, you know, the, the intentions going in, you know, when, when you're in that moment, and, and I think it's, it's a great parallel to so many other things in life where when you're doing a hard thing, it's much easier to embrace that hard thing and lean in. And if you resist it, if you try to fight it, like if you're, you know, cause what combo does is it, it, there's a lot of different compounds in it and in those, uh, the symptoms of this experience are very rapid onset of, uh, flushing heat, swelling of the face, um, you know, potential nausea, uh, your heart rate goes up, your blood pressure drops. Like it's, it's a lot of things going on at once and it comes on very quickly and it, it lasts 15 to 20, 30 minutes. There's no real pain, but there's immense discomfort. And you know, you're going to get out of that, Mm -hmm. right? You just got to make it through. And yeah, even, even hearing about it just makes me feel kind of like uncomfortable face off right now. now. But, (laughs) but, but I like, I like talking about this type of stuff because I feel like even, even though combo is not a psychedelic, you said you don't hallucinate. No, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are going on with research, with the mind and Mm -hmm. things that affect your mind like psychedelics or something like combo that people are paying more and more attention to Mm -hmm. because we know a lot about the things that go on in this world that are outside of our mind but i feel like people are paying more attention to something like a combo experience where it may seem weird but 50 years from now 20 years from now whenever this could be a normal thing and a normal treatment and you and you see that with a lot of the psychedelic research going on right now at, at Johns Hopkins Institute, they're testing psychedelics on people with PTSD, with addiction, eventually for the betterment of healthy people. Mm-hmm. And so for anyone listening who understandably thinks this is weird, and, and yeah, a lot of it seems weird to me too, and, and I've never tried it. I, I like talking about it because it's abnormal in a way. Yeah. It's, not, it's not the usual way of thinking, and it challenges you to kind of step outside of what you consider normal which in a time like this in in covid we're recording this in august of 2020 like being outside of normal is the normal thing right now it's the normal thing and and i think when you look at what normal has gotten us and where it's gotten us into a society um i don't want to be normal you know i don't want to i don't want to be like not only just intrinsically like oh i want to be unique you know but i don't want to I, i don't believe that the normal that we had or or have is healthy. And, you know, so I, I take great, um, pride and responsibility for how, you know, what I put into my body on a regular basis and, uh, how I, how I show up from a physical and emotional and mental standpoint. And, you know, there's a, there are a couple resources to, to look into if you're interested in this Sapo in my soul by Peter Gorman is a beautifully written book on, um, on this subject. And Peter was the, was the investigative journalist who brought combo to the West basically mm-hmm. in the early eighties. Uh, the other resource I would say in, in my connection to it is a gentleman by the name of Simon Scott and he has a site called combo cleanse.com. I would check that out. Mm-hmm. But you know, I think more than anything, like I, I, I've dove into the research. I, I, I understand a little bit more than I think most people, what physiologically kind of is happening. Mm -hmm. And I've experienced it so many times I've seen it, you know, administered it a a lot of times as well. And, and, but ultimately like if you break it down, like I burn and poison myself and there's a mental edge I have by knowing that, that I do hard shit. Like I take this burning orange hot vine and I just go, and then I sprinkle some shit on knowing like where I'm going to be in 20 minutes. And then knowing where I'm going to be tomorrow, knowing that I did that hard thing. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of things now in my life are not nearly as hard as a combo experience. Mm-hmm. And so cool. I can handle it. Well, doing hard shit has been something that has been in your life since I've known you. And it's been, and for <laughs> those of you hearing the sirens in the background, we, we had the window open, but our videographer Manoa was kind enough to 
Yeah, no, no, it's not for us. It's not for us. It's for the apartment building down the block. Um, but yeah, doing hard shit has been something that you've done since I've known you, since the, the first time we ever met in person when we were in the University of Richmond weight room and you were working out and I was still playing baseball. Mm-hmm. And from running multiple businesses, being a financial advisor, to jumping into fitness full time and, and bettering the the mind, body and spirit to do hard things and to do it consistently, you have to have discipline and discipline seems like something that is a resource that is always wanted, but at a time like this is lower, like people mm-hmm. that have insane amounts of discipline at a time when things are abnormal it's not common, especially to the level that you have it. You have a, a workout streak that is in the thousands of days. Yeah. What do you think it is that you understand about discipline and that you've come to know about discipline that maybe the average person may not either be aware of or be using or, or tapping into to be able to do some of the things you've done with your mind and body? It's a really good question, man. Um, I think that with something like discipline, it's easier if the thing you're committing to you love and that's going to get you through a lot of the harder days where you really don't want to do it. Uh, like I, I love expressing myself physically. I love moving around. And so for me to, to um, for me to have a, a streak, I call it the streak, right? I'm a 1,650 something days of my, my definition is setting aside time, or making a concerted effort to set aside time to better myself physically every day. And that can look like a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. But the fact that I love that makes it a lot easier to be disciplined in it. And of course, there are days where I don't want to do it or I dra- drag myself out of bed at, at you know, 11.50 a- at p.m. Like, fuck, mm-hmm. I didn't do it. And I'm like, I got to get out and do something, you know. But I think one is, is f- being in love with or falling in love with the process of doing the thing, which is very key in my opinion. Um, you know, the, the second thing is looking at scenarios where you don't do the thing and who you become, you know, project that forward if you, you know, didn't do it. Cause a lot of times we're motivated by fear or, or in my case, the fear of regret. And so I look Mm -hmm. at a life, you know, where I don't do hard things or I don't stay disciplined or I don't, um, you know, fully lean into becoming the person that I could be. And that thought scares me off the couch oftentimes, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, because I've got a father who's hundred pounds overweight and a diabetic, and I know he's not going to make it to, to see, you know, the time frame that I would like him to be in, you know, just from a health health standpoint. And and that's, it was not like he was dealt a bad card. Like type two diabetes is on the individual for Mm -hmm. more often type one is totally different, but type two, the one that 90% of diabetics have is, like that shit's on you, you know? And, and, um, I, I, I have been in, you know, staying on the health and fitness topic of discipline. I've been hurt. I've been in the hospital with a spider bite and a bad infection. And like, you know, like all, when, when you don't have your health, I think, you know, maybe people can identify with this now. It's, it's the only thing that matters, the health Mm -hmm. of you and your loved ones. And so being disciplined behind that to me is easy. Now I still have problems or, or I have, um, opportunities for growth in areas, other areas that I don't love. Like you've got a fantastic meditation streak or, or a discipline habit with that. And that's mm-hmm. something that I've had a difficult time, you know, grasping onto from the traditional meditation standpoint, you yeah. know, and, and sticking with that. But, um, you know, make it bite size, hold yourself accountable, tell other people about it. And and I love the streak concept. I love the do something every day because once you get over two digits and certainly over three, like if you do something for a hundred days in a row, you want to get to 101, you know, and then you want to see how far you can take it. So, so part of what's motivating you is the fear that you don't want to become someone else, someone that's a, a worse version of, who you are right now because you're either growing or you're becoming shittier yeah. basically bricks and shit man uh so i i think it's a fear of not becoming something and then a, a wonder like i I've, think i've always had a natural 
like sparkle or, or in my eye or wonder mm-hmm. for like the, like the beauties of life, you know, like I can see a butterfly and just get fucking fascinated by that for, mm-hmm. you know, for minutes, you know, and then pop back into reality. Right. And, and I just have this wonder and fascination and, and, and desire to see like, what kind of cool shit could I do if I really tried? And that has led me to really try in a couple of things and a lot of other things I haven't really tried in, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and I regret those instances of not trying oftentimes. I, I like the streak aspect. It's funny. We're talking about the streak because in the meditation app that I use, Sam Harris waking up, there's a streak in the meditation app and he recently took that away with the last update. Mm. And I was like, motherfucker. Like, <laughs> it was that like, what, like 142 or, or, or something like that. That's a dopamine hit, man. That's a win. That's like, yeah. a, that's a, that's a check. Yeah. And he, and he had his own, he had his own rationale behind it, which made sense, which is that you're not meditating for the streak. You're, you're meditating to become a better person. And at, but at the same time, the streak is motivating to know Mm -hmm. that like you've done something a thousand days in a row but on the opposite end of that in in the book atomic habits james clear talks about this rule basically where on, on the opposite spectrum of streaks if streaks is that you're trying to stack up days where i'm gonna do this 500 days in a row i'm gonna do this five days in a row whatever it is whatever point you're at on the other end of that you want to say okay, I'm not going to be the type of person who misses this two days in a row Mm. if you do break that streak. So I found myself tapping into that aspect, a lot of it too, especially once the meditation streak went away because it kind of scares me too when I think about being uh, overweight as a kid and like when I miss two workouts in a row, I'm like, oh no, like I'm becoming the fat kid again and then like three is a lifestyle like if you do something three days in a row that's like i think of that as like okay this is my new life now so when i'm doing something i try to tap into this sense of okay i might have i might have missed today maybe it was good for me maybe it wasn't but like i'm sure as fuck not gonna miss it two days in a row that's a really good mentality to have because what it avoids is it means it avoid it, it helps people avoid taking full weekends off which can turn into the whole next week, which can snowball, right? So if you got to do something Saturday or Sunday, right? Cause you can't have two off days, quote mm-hmm. unquote. Um, I think that really helps a lot of people. I tend to be more, uh, like I can flip things on and off and, mm-hmm. and I'm either all in or I'm all out. And, and I like to follow blocks, you know, like just from the traditional weight training standpoint, you know, it's like, okay, this is my block of time. This is yeah. my program for this time. And so right now I've had, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up here for a, a very dear friend's wedding that, that we just had. And, and, you know, this week was an off week and I have eaten like fuck shit this week, you know, because I know on Monday I'm going to go and then I'm back on yeah. and, and I just, I have the self-awareness and I have the experience in that to know that I can make that switch and I won't have any issues. In fact, I want to, cause I don't feel great physically. Like I don't feel like I normally feel right now. I think I probably feel quote unquote normal, mm-hmm. you know, based on how I've eaten and my habits over this past week. Um, but I, I, I don't want to feel normal. I want to feel like I want to th- thrive and feel great all the time. And it's, yeah. it's getting back to that place. So for those moments, which, for those moments where y- your actions don't align with your feelings, which I think is a special sauce. You always want what you're about to do. You always want to feel like doing what's good for you. You mm-hmm. want to feel like working out. You want to feel like eating healthy. You want your actions and emotions to align. And those moments, which has no doubt happened hundreds of times in your life, when you have a streak like that, and not only in fitness, but in other things too, in, in the in the mind and body, in those moments where you don't feel like doing the thing that you're about to do, and you do it anyway, what sort of processes or mindset or or any, it could even be something like listening to a song, like a like a mm-hmm. practical thing. What what are some of the things that you do to get yourself back into okay? Like I don't feel like doing this, but it's going to be done. There's, there's no other option. The streak holds me accountable. So I, I know with, from that standpoint, like mm-hmm. I just have to do it. Like there's no way I'm going to like 
tell my friends and buddies and like make a post tomorrow. Like, Oh guys, I was lazy yesterday and just like mm-hmm. didn't do it. You could Photoshop it for <laughs> <laughs> the day, right, date and time. Right. You know? Be like, Dave, why is your head on the rocks body? <laughs> <working?"> <laughs> right. Damn it. Um, you know, if we're not talking about that, we're just talking about healthy habits in general or, or whatever it is that you're kind of getting back into. A couple things have helped me in, in a lot very recently. Um, you know, one is an understanding of like what you, what one actually has to do in order to build habits and change the brain, like physiologically what goes on. Mm-hmm. And there's a really great show with, uh, Dr. Andrew Huberman or Huberman from, uh, I think he's at Stanford. Mm-hmm. Um, but he was on rich roll. He was on Joe Rogan and he talked about the process of neuroplasticity and changing your brain. And it connected a lot of dots for me because I realized that I was, you know, maybe like subconsciously or, or just like I was doing these things that kind of you need to do in order to, to change your brain. And what he says and paraphrasing it and potentially butchering it, I, I hope not. But uh, he he says there's two things you have to have. You have to have periods of intense focus and periods mm-hmm. of deep rest and relaxation. And when I changed, you know, a couple, maybe 18 months, two years ago, I, I changed my main health habit focus other than my streak. I changed that to sleep and I don't do early workouts anymore. Yeah. I just don't do it. My body doesn't like it. My like ankles and knees don't like it. I personally don't like it. It pisses me off and I would much rather work out in the dark after work than in the morning before work. And thus I started pushing things back. I prioritize sleep and that changed my life. And, and knowing that like you have to have these periods of agitation. And so when you feel like shit or you don't want to do it, or you've got the resistance to it, you know, uh, uh, Steven Pressfield in turning pro talks about that resistance, right? Mm -hmm. And and the resistance to your art, the resistance, like leaning into the resistance. Yeah. Same thing with combo. Like Mm -hmm. when you're, when you're in the shit, if you can breathe and smile, you can get through it. Cause it's only yeah. a period of time. Everything ends, right? It's mm-hmm. just a period of time. And so, you know, when Huberman, Dr. Huberman said, you have these periods of intense focus and then intense relaxation and the agitation on the front end is called by a release or is caused by a release in adrenaline or, you know, epinephrine, norepinephrine. And, and in order to, you know, in order to actually learn, you if you stick with that period of frustration, like let's say you're like, I'm going to study Spanish for an hour. And like the first, like to start sucks. Mm-hmm. You're like, fuck, you like cleaned your house and like you've had four sips of water. Or Find four every of water. Yeah, exactly. You're book. like, all right, I'm going to do this. Yeah. And you sit down you like open the book and you're like, fuck these flashcards, you know? And like, but once you, once you get that, if you can stick through that and get to the end and, and I call it fulfilling the contract you have with yourself or upholding the contract you made with yourself. Like I'm going to go on a 10 mile run. And it could suck. I'm going to have ups and downs, but getting to that 10 miles or getting to that hour done, what happens is your body releases dopamine, which mm-hmm. gives you, it buffers norepinephrine. It buffers adrenaline. It gives you like a, like a, that check. Okay. Yeah. That it's the, it's your body's reward system and stacking those motherfuckers on top of one another. will change the pathway. It changes your brain. everything, man. It ch- literally changes the synapses, the, the neurons, the connections in your brain. And so, you know, leaning into it and knowing that that's part of the process, like, like this agitation, I feel this frustration, I feel me feeling like shit, you know, to start this workout or or doing this workout is part of it. There's Mm -hmm. also, you've got to realize that, you know, you got to rest right there. You've got to know your body. You, you, oh man, that feel like I could tweak something like knowing the difference between like, I should stop. Versus like, oh, come on, man. Like you can push yeah. through that little cramp or whatever it is. Like knowing yourself is really important. Um, but it's also not rule of law that if you feel like trash, you're going to perform like trash. Like I've had some of my best workouts and best races and experiences when at the start line or, you know, beginning stages of it or middle of it, like I don't feel good. And then I'm looking at my splits. And I'm like, holy shit. Like yeah. I'm fucking flying or like, you know, didn't want to start this and then end up like having an amazing experience, you know? So it's weird how that happens. There have been a few times back when I was playing baseball at Richmond where if I had a thousand dollars that I had to bet on the outcome of a game I was pitching, I would have been like, I feel so shitty today. Yeah. I, there's no shot in hell. I get out of this without giving up 10 runs and, and five innings. <laughs> and Sometimes I, f- the f- times that I felt the shittiest, it just clicks. And maybe it's because I go into it knowing 
not to expect a lot. Yeah, or maybe I don't, yeah I'm yeah. like, I feel like shit. So if I give up 10 runs today, five runs, whatever, like I felt like shit. I, I prepared during the week, but for whatever reason I woke up, like my arm felt like my shoulder was cranked or my elbow. And then there've been other times where I wake up and I'm like, damn, like I've never felt better. And I go, right. I give up six runs. I'm like, what the fuck happened? Right. Like how it, it's, it's weird how there can be a disconnect sometimes between the way that you feel and the way that you perform, but that's only more of a more motivation to try to do things that you need to get done, even when you don't feel like it and kind of cure the anxiety with the action. And, and once you kind of get into the thick of it, there's nowhere else, there's nowhere else you would rather be. Once you get past that agitation state, once you get past, you know, the first five minutes of a podcast or the first five minutes of starting to write or the first five minutes of a workout, there's, li- there's literally no other place you'd rather be besides right. in the flow state of whatever it is that you're doing. It's just like the start of it. Like, I wish our brains were wired differently. It's like, right. why the fuck whoever created us? Couldn't they have made us like, yes, give me like the agitation. <laughs> oh, I'm so excited yeah. to yeah, like uncomfortable, <laughs> uncomfortable shit. Like, yes, I want that. I want to get punched in the face and run 10 miles. And like, but it's like a weird thing that you have to overcome where, and I'm, I'm overcoming this more and more every day where the things that are make you uncomfortable and the things that make you feel like shit a lot of times are are good for you in, in the long term. The and things that you never regret. Like I'll, I'll never regret completing a workout. I'll right. never regret recording a podcast. Even if it doesn't go the way I want to go, like I've learned something and I've grown in some way. And, and that's because you've committed to the process of it. Yeah. And you understand that it is a process. And, you know, it's so cliche, man. And and I and it's kind of one of those things. Cliche like, for a reason. It's cliche for a reason. Yeah. And, and until, I think, until someone actually experiences it, it's very easy to dismiss as cliche, but Mm -hmm. you know, doing those hard things consistently builds a, a like, it's, it's just like this internal knowing, you know, like uh, it's something that, that is, nobody can take that shit away from Mm -hmm. you. You know, like I, I know for a fact that, you know, I've hit it 1,650 plus days in a row. And no one can take that shit from me. Like there's a, there's a confidence that I have solely stemming from doing the work. That's it. Like I didn't grow up a confident person in many other Mm -hmm. aspects of my life. I'm not that right. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you know, the confidence that I have now is derived from knowing that I put in that work and that that is, um, that's something I can control And, and I'm young, man, I'm 32 years old. So, I got, or you level, got at least level five years two. left, dude. At, at least, least five or six. Yeah. I'm aiming for like, like <laughs> forty and I'm out. Day twenty eight thousand of this streak. You yeah, know? like, yeah. There's this guy, oh, man, Ron something. Ron Hill, I think it is. He's mm-hmm. an Englishman. Uh, he competed in the Olymp in the Olympics. He ran in the '60s. And he had like a couple year long streak before he even got to the Olympics. And his, you know, he was good at running. His training, you know, partner was like, oh, you can't be doing this shit every day and you know his coach or whatever and and so once he got done with the olympics he started a running streak and i think he ran one mile every day and he averaged seven miles a day for something like 48 years bro. Jesus. years and he ended up like breaking the streak at you know something like 52 or 53 years in so what a I'm, what a bitch i want to Fucking legend, dude, that's fucking dude. crazy. Yeah. You know, and, and so I look at my shit, I'm like, man, four and a half, I ain't, I ain't shit. You know, just, just knowing yeah. that there's always levels to stuff and, and it's just, it's fun to chase and see what you can do. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've talked about this before and I'm about to make you blush, but <laughs> through podcasting, I've been fortunate enough to link up with a lot of people that are the cliche or kind of like the hustle version of success where you know, they have a lot of followers or, you know, they're, they're at the top of their field in terms of making money and they're like super widely known, but in person, they don't have the the swagger that you would expect would come with that type of success. And they're, and and I'm not pointing out anyone in in particular on the podcast. This is just something I've noticed in, in general too. But when, Every time I talk to you and every time we link up in person or, or even if it's just 
on the the phone, whatever it is, you have a presence and you have a way about you where it's like, oh fuck, like Dave's here, and you walk into the room, and I it, it doesn't matter what level of success you think you are in terms of following or, or making money or things like that. Like those things are irrelevant. I think it does come from the fact that you do the hard shit. And you, you are willing to put yourself through those those challenges, whether it's a mind challenge, body challenge, yeah. spiritual challenge, like the combo. And that gives you that presence that no amount of money or fame or notoriety can give you. Like you walk into a room and you're it's like you're a badass person who doesn't have to say they're a badass. Like you, you people just know that you have that. I appreciate that a lot, man. Thank you. And I was actually thinking about some like a similar topic earlier today I was kind of thinking about where confidence comes from because I I haven't been you know like I said I haven't been confident my whole life and and I think early on I realized that that I think I cared way too much about what other people thought and so I decided to do my best to not care what people thought and just like Mm -hmm. oh fuck it I'm just gonna like do my own thing be my own person and just embrace being weird you know because weird is just different than like you as the individual, you know, yeah. like I look at a lot of people I'm like, oh, that's weird as shit. You know, the way that people eat nowadays is weird. The mm-hmm. inactivity for people is weird. Like 80% of America is so weird to me and foreign to me just cause it's different to me, you know, but yeah. yet in the context of general society, like they're normal. Right. And so I think early on I embraced being weird simply as a defense mechanism to kind of like just stay in my own bubble. Like, fuck it. I'm mm-hmm. just going to do me. Like, and as I layered in the work ethic, which I learned, you know, over time, and I learned that pretty late, frankly, Mm -hmm. like in, in my twenties, um, but layering on that work ethic onto the, I don't give a fuck. Like I do give a fuck, but I just really don't at all. Like you should see the pants I'm wearing right now. (laughs) Oh, we're we're going to, we're going to put up the the pictures and video. If you're you're, you're listening to this now on the the podcast app, you should definitely tune into the the YouTube version. hundred percent. I got to close up. Oh yeah. (laughs) Thank you. My man. We'll get a picture with the jacket later too. Perfect. Perfect. You know, but it's, it's like, it's, it's just silly. And, and I'm, I'm, I think inherently a playful, silly person. Like I like, I love play. I, I love joy, you know? And, and, you know, it comes from being in a place now, you know, thank goodness that where I'm happy and, and that, that is really a, a stark difference to many, um, periods in my life where, you know, I might've been able to put on a, a good face or like, you know, good vibes. Like, you know, we've got just great energy and like good mm-hmm. buddies and, you know, like we can high five and hug it out and talk about funny shit. Yeah. And like, you know, so the vibes almost we, always going to be we've been, high. We've been hugging the entire time we've been recording this. We're, 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 right? we're, we're sharing the same mic and it's, it's in between us and we're hugging this entire time. It's, it's a beautiful thing. It's a bromance yeah. of yeah. like none other. I'm a little bit hard. Um, I'm very hard. 50, 50. Yeah. Uh, it'll get there. So <laughs> I, I completely got sidetracked by the erection. Um, Oh, I was I was gonna say, I wonder if people will become weirder because of quarantine and isolation. Because I hope. I've definitely one of the benefits of being in solo quarantine in my apartment is going fucking crazy without social contact and trying figuring out how to deal with that. And when you're not talking to your friends in person as much yes you can catch up on zoom and facetime but it's not the same when you're not going to events and and bars and talking about what you're doing you get less feedback on the things that you're trying and a lot of the things that i want to try are weird that i may have otherwise been talked out of doing but Mm -hmm. now it's like i'm in my apartment alone i'm gonna record this fucking weird video that maybe it's like weird or cringy or maybe a lot of people like it or you know i'm just gonna play this character in a in a you know, TikTok video or whatever, just like, cause it's fun to do or record, fuck around with music, whatever. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm doing more shit that might be considered weird because that whole professional nine to five facade is taken away. Yeah. People are zooming during the day, but it's like, you're, you're, that's gone. Like you don't have to be this other person in the office from nine to five. Like you can be 
more of the person you are when it's like you hang up the the phone, you exit the Zoom call, and you're like, oh fuck, like I'm back. You can lean back, I'm back. And like, yeah, 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 like, yeah. like I could be myself. Yeah. So did you find yourself doing that when you were a kid, that type of thing? Yeah, yeah. I've uh, me and my brothers have always kind of ran with these comedy skits, even when we. We weren't filming them. My, my, so both of my brothers are quarantining with my parents right now. So they've been messing around with some comedy videos. Mm-hmm. But we've always kind of come up with these ideas in our head and would kind of role play and act them out and just go with it at the dinner table until my mom or dad's like, all right, like, chill the fuck out. Like, stop, like sit down, like stop standing on the table. But we've always kind of done that thing where... Uh, it's just like fun to play someone else or Mm -hmm. like imagine a situation and then just take it as far as you can until you're done or it's not funny anymore or whatever. Kind of like whose line is it anyway type type thing like that old TV show. Did you grow up watching that? Yeah. 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 Is that with uh, Drew Carey? Yeah. 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 I watched that with my dad a lot uh, growing up. Improv stuff. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's less of I would say it's less, improv because I never really felt the pressure to do the yes and exercise right. that they did right, improv. Right, right. It was more like we would see, uh, you know, see something on TV and be like, yo, could you imagine if this happened, but it was set in on a farm instead? Or like the other day I, I was texting my brothers, um, Cause I heard a song and I was like, this would be the song if I was John wick before I started, you know, shooting up the club and mm-hmm. killing the bad guys. Like mm-hmm. this would be the song that it's I would want to hear in my headphones. Like when I'm just like getting ready to do it. I'm like cracking the double my neck. That, yeah. That and before I just like pull like double guns. Out of the, so <laughs> Wyatt like the, Earp. Yeah. And then we just started like going off on a tangent on like John wick and all this shit. But yeah, but I've always loved kind of just exploring weird ideas and, that has to go away a little bit if you are in a professional environment. And so hopefully people will start to get in touch with their weird or get in touch with their normal. Cause yeah, the weird is yeah. the, the facade that you put on the yeah, normal 100%. is like, the, like I can fuck around and do some shit now. So and, quarantine almost gave you permission to be more you. Mm-hmm. Is that accurate? I think so. Yeah. I, I think if there's a benefit, a main benefit of quarantine, it would be, being more myself and kind of getting used to like you were saying, not really investing in other people's opinions and doing what I want to do because I want to do it and then letting them react however they react. I think it's important not to get invested in other people's timelines as well. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and again, that kind of goes against the weird or with the weird thing and against the normal thing, you know, but the, I think a lot of people get in trouble doing, and holding to society's standards of what they should be or should not be doing at any particular time or their parents' standards or, you know, their friends' standards and whatnot. And, um, it embracing who you are, what you actually want to do, like knowing what that is, like going through the perfect day exercise, like actually writing shit down, figuring Mm -hmm. out what your goals are, you know, and, and, and not being afraid to embody that. Uh, and not being afraid to be the person who dot, dot, dot does mm-hmm. X, Y, Z. You know, I, I think that's really important. And hopefully silver linings of this experience that we've all had, the shared experience over the past four or five months and, you know, continuing however long is more of a return to that understanding of of who we were as kids that we got mm. conditioned out of us and, and, you know, by society and parents and everything else and school and work and 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 being more true to the that like quintessential essential version of who we are Mm -hmm. you know well speaking of that quintessential version a a large part of the version of who you are is spartan racing yeah spartan has been a huge part of your life we were talking about it just before this podcast for people who may not be familiar with spartan could you lay out briefly what spartan races are kind of like the the thick of it and what introduced you to spartan how, how did you get involved with the races before we yeah. get into it um so spartan is a brand of ocr or obstacle course racing you know and, and there's 
Tough Mudder and Savage Race and, you know, all these other different brands and, you know, the, the pictures of your friends that you see after weekends of them covered in mud and somehow like smiling and stoked is, yeah. you know, it's, it's in essence, that's a, that's an OCR event. Right. And, you know, I originally got into this thing as, um, a, a, you know, holy shit, dude, you should see this YouTube video, you know, like living with five or six guys out of, you know, kind of closely out of college. And two of us saw a YouTube video of, you know, throwing spears and jumping through the mud and, you know, yada, yada. And, uh, I was a couple years removed from a very, um, you know, intense and disciplined and focused period of my life. You know, I power lifted for four years through college and then was a strength coach at university of Richmond for a year. Mm-hmm. And, you know, was doing strong man competitions through that. And, and then when I, when I left that space and dove into my financial planning career, I lost, or I just stopped, uh, having motivation, time, energy efforts. I, I zero desire to go back into the gym. And this was kind of that first four way for a back into that space, maybe two years removed from, from leaving it, you know, the health and fitness space. And, um, you know, I ran my first race, in uh september of 2013 Mm -hmm. it was in wintergreen uh virginia in the ski ski mountains and you know an obstacle course race is has a lot of different elements to it and i think that's what drew me to it is is it wasn't a specialized sport you know like i played soccer growing up um you know the gym weightlifting can be very specialized like it's just this like i'm just in a gym i'm just lifting these bars with these round plates and um you know there's leaping and running and falling and crawling and, and running up terrain and running down terrain and monkey bars and, you know, all kinds of over walls and under walls and all kinds of shit. It was fun. Mm -hmm. It was play. I was playing in the woods and the vibes are super high. And, you know, I realized I did one. It sucked while I was doing it. I felt great after I was done. I forgot how bad it sucked because I signed up for the next year. did it again. (laughs) Sucked just as much, but I, I did better, you know, because I was more active and I was like, Oh shit. Like, I actually did a lot better. Like maybe I'll sign up for another one and just like try a little bit, you mm-hmm. know, and, and I evolved from, you know, getting my ass kicked, like truly like finishing 1500th or something like that. And, you know, then starting to take it a little bit more seriously, realizing that because of the inherent nature of the sport, I could be good at it with my aerobic, you know, conditioning, mm-hmm. running background from soccer and my strength background, combining those two things is pretty, yeah. pretty gnarly in OCR. And so, uh, I fell in love with the sport and dove all in. So what kind of flipped the switch for you from going from just competing to wanting to place competitively and, and what changes in your routine did you start to make? Because you were, like you said, you were still doing financial advising yeah. full time when you started. What what sort of things did you start to change about how you were approaching the races that led you from fifteen hundredth to you've placed first in your age group? Age group I believe. Yeah. So Top. what was the what were kind of the the essential factors that led to those changes? Uh, it took a long time, and that was you know not getting discouraged by not hitting goals early on. You know, I, I set a goal that I wanted to compete at the OCR World Championships, and I was in no business d- making that goal really. You know, it was very, very, very far out. It ended up taking me like four years to get there. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but that was a big lesson for me in you know setting. You know, there's no such thing as an unrealistic goal or dream, just an unrealistic timeline. That's a great Tim Ferriss quote that I, yeah. I bring up a lot. Um, you know, but I, I realized that and it's kind of funny you asked this question because the past, you know, since quarantine happened, I, I decided like, fuck it. I got all this time. I'm going to do a hard training block. And it's been 20 weeks basically in the hole of like, like I've kept a log, like mm-hmm. old school shit, like diving in, like, all right, let's fucking go. Like, let's get fit and like see what happens. Right. And I've learned so much in this block about myself from hard work and like doing the work because I think I spent a lot of my first four or five, six years of, you know, the past four or five, six years before this trying to hack my way through this, Mm -hmm. right? Like I want to focus on sleep. I'm going to make sure that I'm eating a lot or drinking well, or, you know, I put a treadmill in my office for financial planning, you know, where I, I, yeah, I would, when I saw you (laughs) walking on the treadmill, taking calls and and then making changes on the the board for the Spartan races yeah. and financial planning at the same time. You're a true multi, you're, you're multitasker is 
an understatement. Uh, it was more like you had things going on in your life, but you were locked into one and then you would go back to another. Like you would take a call for finance and be fully on the call. And then you would plan out something that was unrelated, but for the uh, Spartan racing. Oh, wow. So it wasn't like multitasking, but it was like, <laughs> right. yeah, you had, you were honed in and you'd switch gears so quickly back and forth. I, I think it's, efficiency matters to me a lot because in a lot of the times, like I, I don't, you might think I'm, or people listening might think that I like, I love all this stuff and I love working hard. Like I'm, I'm inherently a super lazy dude. Like mm -hmm. I like chilling a lot and you know, I, I like taking it easy. I like relaxing. I like, you know, not working my ass off. You know, I just realized that that's part of the process and part of the deal. And, and I, I think that once I started to layer a couple of things on one another, it's like, okay, well, you know, I need to walk more. Okay. Well, how can I do that? Um, well I could get up early in the morning and walk for an hour or I could instead like I'm, I'm sitting in an office all day long. I need to stand more. I need to move more. I could buy a treadmill off Craigslist for $150 mm -hmm. and build a little two by four desk on top of it. And, and if I walk at 1.8 miles per hour, I won't sweat through my suit. And I could like take calls. I could type at that at that speed. I had my little file. Like I got my yeah. notebook, notebook and everything. And like two or three hours later, like I'm, I've walked five and a half miles. And cool. Now I've got more steps. And you know, I now I'm not being in that environment. You know, I, I have the treadmill, but I don't really use it because I'll take phone calls or coaching calls while I'm walking. Or I'm outside. We talked about vitamin D earlier. Like I'm, I'm yeah. got my shirt off. I'm, I'm, so there's vitamin D. I've got my water bottle in my hand, so I'm getting more water. Uh, I'm learning. I'm listening to a podcast, or I'm, I'm doing a coaching call, and, and I'm moving. You know, and so I'm stag. I'm doing a lot of healthy things at once, which means that I can like lay on the couch later, or you know, not be so stressed. Mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's, it's finding ways to be efficient with things. Um, but you know, rap kind of bringing it back around. Like now I know like in order to really achieve those heights, you just got to fucking put in the work. And what's, what's you something know. that you've altered in your routine now because of being in the hole that you might've not realized before quarantine? What, what's something that you've changed during these 20 weeks, however long it's been, where you now have a better way of doing something that's fitness related, Spartan related tire pulling, tire pulling, dude, I tell you what, uh, I got a harness and an old shitty tire from the side of the road. And I have pulled this motherfucking tire around a track for so many hours. Um, and again, I'm listening to podcasts or mm -hmm. calling buddies. I, we've actually had conversations where I pulled the tire behind me like the whole time. And there's probably just this low, low grade just of the gravel <laughs> so is it lawn. you have the rope and no no it's it's like a, a vest, vest a harness okay. and then like um you're strapped in with a d-ring on on the back to the vest okay. and to the tire and so it's like equal weight distribution yeah yeah, yeah. exactly and, and you don't run in it you just walk but what it does it helps to build your your like power to ground ratio and it helps to put you in a in a lean like your body naturally gets into this lean where it's like it's a perfect optimal position for running, you know, like your body is going to like that fall forward when you, when you run, like that's mm -hmm. the position you're in pulling the tire. And for me, what it's done is it keeps me in the heart rate zone that I want to be in for building my aerobic capacity, like for getting better at endurance. It, it doesn't allow me to creep up too high. Cause in the end it's just walking mm -hmm. and the tire is like, not that heavy. Like it's not like you're fucking pushing a car or pulling a car or something mm -hmm. like, you know, so it allows me to get my heart rate above walking but well below running kind of in that sweet spot. And I'm able to do more things. Like, like I said, I can be efficient with it and then I can save my running miles and time for like real work, mm -hmm. like, like getting out on the trail or doing speed work or doing tempo work or getting on the track or running Hills. And so the actual time that a lot of people are putting in dead mileage or dead time, you know, like, just like, Oh fuck, I got to train for an hour. Like I might as well go slog mm -hmm. out some miles. Like it's not the way to do it. If someone was to set this up, what type of surface do you use? How, how long or how many times a week do you usually do tire pulling? Yeah. Um, you know, I, you build up to anything. There's a progression mm -hmm. to anything and everything in this, in this, you know, in the health and fitness world. And so mm -hmm. depending on where you are physically, uh, but anybody can do it. And that's the thing, no matter wh whether you're just off the couch, you can do this. Right. And so, um, you know, the, the, 
a road has more surface area, you know, more grabbing of the tire than a gravel track or like a dirt path or something Mm -hmm. like that. And so I would start on the gravel track or dirt path. Um, you know, the first tire I got was way too freaking big. Like I got like a, like a truck tire and it turned out like that, that, and I tried to pull it on the road and I was like, Oh my God, like this is not going to go well, you know? And so I got a smaller tire and went to a track and that worked out a lot better. So, um, it, you should be able to walk relatively comfortably with it. You should be able to feel like within the first 15 minutes, like, Oh, this is fucking stupid. And you should do it for, you know, 30 to 45 minutes once or twice or three times a week, depending on your fitness levels Mm -hmm. to start. And you'll see benefits um, because you'll be able to do ultimately being fit is about doing work and recovering Mm -hmm. from it. Who can do the most work and recover from it. Right. And so, This allows you to stay injury free or, or, you know, reduce, greatly reduce the likelihood of injuries, uh, thus being able to do more work and recover from it. Yeah. Going back to the Spartan race, is there a moment from one of the races? Well, I'm sure you have many moments that you kind of tap into and go back to for struggle and, and to say, I've gotten through this so I can do this now i I go back to that moment is there a moment in particular or a race that stands out to you where you really thought that shit was not gonna go the way you thought it was gonna go but then managed to tap in and have a a decent finish or or a great finish um ocr worlds in 2018 the the one i qualified for there was an outside of london england and you know, I had it in my goals. I wanted to race internationally. I had it in my goals for a long time. I just wanted to qualify and I ended up going to it and, um, really had zero expectations going in at all whatsoever. You know, like I, I was happy to be there. And I know for a lot of people listening, that might not be the mentality that you might expect. Um, mm-hmm. you know, but I don't like, I, I don't really I'm not really like even searching for wins to be honest with you, man. Like I don't really like, I don't have to win. I'm not that competitive a person. I just want to be, I want to be competitive with myself. You know, mm-hmm. I want to, I want to for myself. Like I don't really care necessarily about like becoming a world champion so much as I care about getting the best out of myself and, you know, let the chips fall where they, where they fall. You know, if that means I'm a world champion or finish a thousand, it's like, okay, but I know I got the best out of myself. And so, you know, I was in, it was a two day event and they had a three K event, you know, which is like a mile and a half ish or a little bit less than that, like a sprint, right? Ton of new obstacles, ton of new crazy shit. Europeans take the sport super seriously. Uh, and you know, I, I gave it my absolute all man. Like, cause it was mm-hmm. a, it was a all out, you know, 25 minute deal. So heart rate super, super high the whole time. And I, and I was happy with my placement, you know, like I didn't finish that great, but I was like, yeah, well, it's probably like, that doesn't, doesn't really suit me for my style. I'm more of a longer grinder type, type person. And, and the next day was the 10 K world or the 15 K world championships, which is 10 miles. And they had a hundred obstacles, hundred obstacles, 10 miles running through the English countryside, like no roads. It's all through the mm-hmm. fucking grass and, you know, little trails and shit. And, um, I remember in that race, there was not a single moment in that race where I was outside of my body or outside of myself. Like I was fully present the whole time. And I had a mantra for the entire race. The mantra was my lungs are strong. My legs are strong. My heart is strong. I am enduring. My lungs are strong. My legs are strong. My heart is strong. I'm I'm enduring. enduring. And I said that shit for like three hours straight, but yet at the same time was completely with it. Mm-hmm. Like looking around, laughing, like, holy shit, I'm running in this fucking race. Like, <laughs> yeah. it's so beautiful here in the English countryside in October, you know? And, and like, like when I got to the finish line of that, it was a big festival type event, you know, and multicultural flags are everywhere, food everywhere, like mm-hmm. people, spectators, et cetera. It was really, really cool. And, and it was my first experience in that level of, of an event. And I remember I got to the finish line, I crossed it, I got the medal, yada, yada. Uh, you know, I went and I got food. I was like, I'm not going to look at how I did. I'm not going to look at how I did. I'm not going to look at how I did. And, you know, I, I had my finisher beer and my medal and I like, I got warm again and, and kind of like change out of my mm-hmm. stuff. And I was like, all right, fuck it. I'm going to go see how I did. And I remember pulling up my name, pulling up the screen and seeing that I got 96th God in my damn. age group. And I like, 
you know, looked again and I was like, holy shit. And I like, I looked at, you know, some names of people that I knew that had finished, you know, a little bit ahead of me or a mm-hmm. little bit below me. And then I started looking around at, at how, well, okay, well, how many people are actually running this thing? You know, mm-hmm. and like, like who am I competing against? And it was beyond my wildest dreams that I could finish top 100 in my age group at that time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and how many people were in this race? There was 2,400 men and they were running it yeah. that were, you know, in, in different age groups, uh, mm-hmm. in my age group, I don't forget exactly six, 700 people, something like yeah. that. And, and you know, there was a so top 100, is yeah, top 100 in sick. that. And, and you know, it was a, um, it was something that I didn't expect and it just, it helped me to set the bar so much higher for myself because I, I know that I wasn't like the fittest I've been in my life coming into that. I know if I were to put, you know, like the avatar of myself then and myself now and run that same race from a fitness standpoint, I would blow my old self out of the water. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's, it's just, but at that moment, like that was something that, that was so out of this world for me. And it was such just a beautiful culmination of everything where like the hard work had paid off. And I like, I remember the scene in my head, you know? Yeah. And it, it was, um, it was one of the most like, fulfilling yet also motivating instances of my life because I sat with that for like that two minutes, you know, maybe I I took a screenshot of it. I like sent it to my like like friends and fam or whatever. And then like, I remember when I was walking back to to catch a bus to go home, I was like 96th. I like pulled it back up on my phone. I was like, well, fuck I missed top 80 by like a minute and a half. Like, I wonder where and I then, leaked out the, a minute and a half. And then the wheels race. start turning. Yeah, exactly. And I'm like, well, how far away was I from like top 10? You know? yeah. <laughs> and then it just starts to go. And, you know, yeah. and, and now I'm, I'm not setting any uh, limits or expectations on, on me on, on either end. Like, I don't have a floor for myself. I don't have a ceiling for myself. I just like, I fucking love this thing, man. I'm just going to keep trying until I hate it. And if I hate it, then I won't do it yeah. anymore. And I don't think a lot of people realize this and, and i don't realize the only reason i realize this is because of talking to endurance athletes like yourself and listening to other people talk about it on podcasts but during these races there's an intense amount of pain that is going through your body at certain points and you have to figure out a way to overcome it and so i listen to guys that run spartan races i'll listen to the the ultra marathoners and it's like at a certain point you have to tell yourself you basically have to like tell your body it sounds like that you are going like you like (laughs) like like, Like, hey buddy this is what's happening yeah Yeah. like this is gonna happen like my left foot's gonna come in front of my right foot and then like my right foot's gonna come into in front of my left foot and and baseball is such a non-endurance sport that i've literally no concept of Tap, being able to tap into what that takes to 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 do like an an, an endurance race like that consistently because baseball is all about the fast twitch delivering the ball to the plate at a high velocity hitting it out of the park at a high velocity so it's like i just need to gear up and then my body needs to do some quick shit for mm-hmm. a millisecond and then that's going to launch the ball and I have to run 90 feet, maybe 360 <laughs> feet. If you're lucky. Maybe, and if I'm lucky, I'll get to trot it. <laughs> right. And then as a pitcher, you get to, you know, you throw a ball as hard as you fucking can, get the ball back, collect yourself. You're like, all right, like, what am I going to eat for dinner? Right, 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 <laughs> right, right, right. right. Um, but yeah, it just, it blows my mind the way that human bodies and, and people are able to train their minds to be able to do things like that and, and get through an experience and basically will yourself through the finish line. And so I'm learning that like I'm, I, you know, playing soccer, like you get these spurts of 30 seconds on 45 seconds on you're sprinting, you're running, you're cutting the ball gets kicked out of bounds and you can rest and you can chill, you know, and that was my come up in endurance sports. And that teach that gives me, that's given me, uh, like a, a, great ability to recover quickly. Right. But I don't necessarily have like the long go stuff. Like I'm I'm not a great natural athlete. Right. And so the, you know, I'm still learning that, man. And I think that's, that's what separates good competitors and like good racers from great world-class champions is that ability to consistently, Mm -hmm. not only in a race, but especially in training, you know, ignore, ignore those signals that your body gives you that it's time to stop or slow down Mm -hmm. when intuitively you know that you know there you're not going to cause 
damage by continuing, mm-hmm. right? You know, because think of a, like a breath hold is a perfect example of this. You know, that first signal you get, if you take a big breath, hold your breath in, you know, 20 seconds, a minute, three minutes, whatever it is, that first time where your body, where you get that, that buildup of carbon dioxide and you're like, fuck, I got to breathe. Yeah. Most people immediately breathe. Right. Mm-hmm. And you know, well, no, like that's just the first signal. Like if, mm-hmm. if you're doing a, if you're in the gym and you're on, you know, set three and you're trying to get, you know, rep 10 and on rep five, you're like, Oh, wow, this is getting kind of heavy. It's kind of hard. Like that's just a signal mm-hmm. and ignoring that maybe you get to 10, maybe you get to 11, maybe you get to 12, maybe you bust out 26, you know, because you ignored that signal. And I'm learning that from an endurance standpoint, but it is a learned thing Mm -hmm. I have found for me. Um, you know, I can run through, you know, and, and I guess what it's, what I've also found is it's a progressive thing. Like I've learned, you know, the, the cramps that you get like in your rib cage when you run or whatever, sometimes like, like this, this, uh, the stereotypical cramp, right? Yeah, like, exactly. Uh, like like, yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Right. I've learned like those don't bother me anymore. I can run straight mm-hmm. through those now, but that was like a learned thing, right? Like I had to like, I had to actually do it one time or two times. Be like, Oh, if I just keep running, it goes away. All right, word. I'll just do that. Yeah. You know? And, but there are other little pains or th- nicks or something that will pop up and I'll be like, Oh fuck. Like I got to shut it down, <laughs> you know? And, and so it is very much like a, a, there's a sliding scale. And I think you, you can, you can stack experiences on top of one another yeah. to get you there. So one of the experiences we spoke about, I believe this was while we were both still in Richmond was you ran a 50 mile race to raise money for a buddy's sister who passed away from leukemia. Mm-hmm. And you, I remember you were talking about deciding to do it. And at that point you had run you, I maybe uh, I'm just re- trying to remember from a few years ago. Maybe it's like twelve or thirteen miles, and, yeah. and correct me if I'm wrong. It's about right. And you went into this race, and you're just like, you know, I'm I'm gonna run fifty miles and do whatever needs to be done to do that. But I'm going to cross the finish line for fifty miles. So for people that have never done that and my, myself included, because I think I might've run like six miles at one point in my right. life forced to, um, what physically goes through your body and you can even go, you know, 10 miles, 20 miles yeah. is what happens. Like what physically happens to your body when you run 50 miles? So for context, I was running at the time I was running Spartan races, but they were maxing out at like a half marathon, like 13 miles or mm-hmm. so. I think in training I had done 15. And then in the two or three months that we had prepared for this race, we originally were going to run, my buddy and I were going to run a, a race. And then we, we like got waitlisted or something like that. So we we're like, fuck it, we're going to do our own thing and tie it to charity, you know, and, and Pat had lost his sister 10 years prior. And I was helping a, you know, I was mentoring a, a young, a young uh, kid by the name of Jack who was going through the exact same, same thing. And mm-hmm. we were raising money for the Connors heroes foundation. And, and so I think in order to, to really like commit to some shit that you think is like fucking impossible, you got to have a deep why behind it, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, um, the most we ran in training was 20 miles. That's where we topped out. And that was like three weeks before the actual race. So I was ill prepared for this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but it wasn't off the couch. And I think there's a big distinction to that. Like if you come off the couch and try to run a 50, like you're fucked and yeah. like, you can do it hundred percent. You can do anything you set your but mind to, your body, to. Will, your be body will be trashed. And you know, so I just wanted to give that context is, you know, I did have athletic training prior to that and was prepared for, I was probably prepared ish for a marathon, you know, but 50 miles is two marathons. And so the first 10 miles, big rookie mistake happens all the time in races Pat and I got, were super stoked and felt good and it was race day and it was early and we went out way too hard. And, you know, really for the first 20 miles, we were 10 minutes off of the PR we had set for 20 miles, like three weeks prior mm-hmm. for the fucking 50 mile, okay. <laughs> which is not good. Yeah. That was not a good start. Um, I felt pretty good personally through 20. Now, from what I understand, I've never run a a marathon, but from what I understand, you know, people tend to hit the wall at about mile 18 
18 to 20 to 22. And the reason being is because that's when your body is deprived of glycogen, which is mm -hmm. the stored carbohydrates that your body uses for energy when your heart rate is above a certain threshold. And we, Pat and I, my buddy and I nailed through the entire race, we nailed two factors that we could control, which really helped us. We nailed nutrition and we nailed hydration, right? Like we were eaten every 30 minutes. We had our, you know, gels and goos mm -hmm. and water and this and that. And, you know, I fucking loved bacon, like mile yeah. like 30 on. I had a, it was hysterical. Like you, you came strapped with the, Dude, the hydration and the snack. hundred percent, hundred percent. And, and like a lot of different types, cause your body's going to give you signals for what you need. Right. And so I had a, a half pound of bacon that had been made and put into a plastic bag. And I had this like camel pack. So I had it over my shoulder and mm -hmm. I remember like I needed fats and I needed salt and I didn't like, know, like I couldn't identify like, Oh, I feel like I need fats and salt right now. But out of everything, like the bacon was the jam. And mm. I was just for the entire, like ba mile. bacon, bacon is the jam <laughs> sitting on my ass. 100%. So I can't imagine 100%. reaching over and my being head, like, Oh just, my God, I found this bacon, the bacon pack backpack. behind me. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I had some, so your feet will swell. That's a really big, big common issue, you know? And so mm -hmm. I had, uh, uh, my, you know, typically like up to a size or a size and a half bigger. And so my, my feet did that. And I, the race, the way that we had set the race up, we had these loops, you know, we had like a, a seven mile loop and a three mile loop. So there are mm -hmm. 10 mile loops. But we came back to the same spot cause we kind of did like a rough figure eight. And so at mile 23, I changed my shoes cause from like 20 to 23, or maybe I know it was mile 30. I changed my shoes from 23 to 30 sucked, dude. I felt like I had a knife going through the, my big toe and I couldn't push off. Mm -hmm. And so that affected my gait because I was having to do other things. You're pushing off the other. Foot yeah, I was landing in a different spot. And so because my right foot was bothering me, I compensated and then my left hip started bothering me. And once I changed my shoes, I didn't have any problems with blisters. My toenails didn't fall off. I didn't have any other like, like no hot spots. Like everything mm -hmm. was great with my feet, but from like 30 to 40 ish, it just starts to fucking hurt. Like you're pounding a long time. Yeah. That's 10, eight, 10 hours at this point, you know, from 40 to 50, um, you know, I was picking up my leg to go up like steps. Like I would grab my underneath my, my knee, like in my back, my you're hamstring, physically like, picking up, pick your up knee my to, leg and put it down. Yeah, yeah, put, yeah. Uh, I realized how important your arms are. And, mm. and, but then I was having like massive cramps in my traps and upper back and shoulders, you know, from like trying to pull everything back yeah, and down like where the they're supposed to be. Constant, like exactly the up and, and down of your muscles, jostling. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we got done with the race. It was like 13 hours or something like that. Uh, Pat's headlamp died cause we forgot to charge it like rookie mistake type shit, mm -hmm. you know? And so we had to walk the last six or seven miles, got really cold, uh, temperature dropped. It was November. We had a legitimate discussion with like three miles left. Like, sh should we lay down on the path and like take a little like rest and like a napper, you know, and like yeah. get back to it. And we were like, no, we can't do that. We got to keep going, you know? So, uh, you know, that next day or that night actually, Pat's sister's a nurse. And so we each had two IV bags, like sailing bags. Mm -hmm. There wasn't anything else in it, but we had IVs and I still pissed Brown the next day. And this is after the, the, the next the day, IV after two bags. IVs and, and I, and nailing nutrition and hydration, mm -hmm. like, like having enough water. Like I, I peed Brown. I was lifting my legs up like to get over, like, like to get up the stairs again, same thing, like using my hands to lift my legs mm -hmm. that only lasted like two days. Um, but, only 48 hours straight of having to yeah. lift your legs. But my whole system was, was trashed like, and, and, uh, like physiologically, like I wear a whoop 99% of the time and, um, you know, it tracks heart rate, heart rate variability, sleep. I was at like, I had a full 50% drop in those measures for months, 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 months. Like it took, that's fucking wild. Took two, three, four months for me to get back to that baseline. And then I had like a lot of little, like little things, like little, like soft tissue things that persisted because I think I dove, I dove back into running too soon. I gave myself six weeks off, but that wasn't enough. And then I, I tried to set my trajectory too high or tried to ramp up too quickly mm -hmm. after that. And so, you know, 
to do this again, I would set that trajectory much longer. I would say like if someone's sitting here now and no matter what your fitness level is like double or triple the amount of time you thought you were going to take to sign mm -hmm. up for that race, yeah. you know, like, like I've got a hundred miler in my future, but you know, I'm 32 now. It, it might be five years until I do that, you know, yeah. and, and I'm going to work up to that, you know, like I tapped out or t topped out at like 30 miles a week this year. Like next year I want to top out around 50 miles a week. And then I want to top out at like 70 miles a week. And then mm -hmm. I'm going to give myself a year to kind of like deload a little bit, you know? And so I'm, I'm taking this like a long trajectory, mm -hmm. you know, a long look at this. Um, and I think that's really important because then you'll get to it a uns, you know, much greater likelihood of being unscathed and B with a much greater appreciation of the actual event. Mm -hmm. Like that is still the, like my crowning achievement and the thing that I'm most proud of in my life is having the courage to dive into that race, knowing I wasn't ready for it and doing it anyway. And I think that's such a beautiful like parallel to so many other aspects of life. And it's given me so much boost and, and courage to do other things like that. Um, because it turned out okay. And it turned out better mm -hmm. than okay. And there were a lot of moments in that race where I was looking like literally like, okay, get to that tree. Like you can do this. And like, and you're like, Oh wait, there's no tree there. I'm, I'm just hallucinating. I'll get so to it anyway. Actually like in the, you know, mile 45 ish mm -hmm. range, like I went to, I felt wobbly and I went to put my hand on a tree and it wasn't there and I fell into the embankment. Oh Jesus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Like it, it was like, I didn't fall off the embankment. Mm -hmm. Like it wasn't like down a slope. I was kind of like falling into yeah. the, the side. But of you, the, you were the seeing thing. things that yeah, were not there. hundred percent. And, and that was only like a 50 mile race. That was only 45 miles in or something like that. Like, you know, I hear, I hear, you know, stories of hundred milers or, you know, Cam Haynes doing the Tahoe 240 and mm -hmm. Goggins running Badwater 135. Yeah. And I'm like, fuck man, there's levels to this shit. There's levels. What, what do you think it is about long distance that fucks up your body so much long distance running where things like the levels dropping in your body of, of recovery by, by 50%. The, is it the constant pounding? Is it, is it what's going on inside your body? Is it yeah. like the, there's something about long distance that just, it wrecks human beings, but people continue to do it. And, and you obviously can get better at doing it and, and run longer and longer. But what is it about the long distance running that is just like, that fucks people up so bad? Um, I think it's a couple of things. One, most people run incorrectly. Most mm -hmm. people like hip strike with their heels. Like the, there's a form to running, just like there's a form to bench pressing or anything like that. And, and most people never learn it. They just think, oh, fuck it. I'm running. Like I can run like, so I can run. Mm -hmm. right? And that's not the case. Um, I think that running inherently is just a lot of compression and a lot of, you know, like just striking force. Right. And, and that alone does a lot. And then when you have a repetitive movement, you know, that's not very varied. Like it's just the frontal plane that you're running in. There's really no side to side. There's no, like you're not juking or cutting or jumping yeah. off something typically, you know, and, and most long races are on concrete or gravel roads. Anyway, you know, we were lucky enough to do this on a trail where we had to stay mentally engaged and there was ups and downs and left to rights. But, um, you know, running, you burn them, you can burn up to a thousand calories an hour running, which is just a huge strain on the human body. Mm -hmm. And you, the body will work up and adapt to anything, anything. Like there are people who have adapted to do 200 mile races and like, yeah, they're good, you know, yeah. but like, like obviously they're going to have maybe similar experiences like I had, but you know, at four times the distance, you know, and, and, but they don't just do that, right. You, mm -hmm. they build up to that and they adapt to that. And so I think a lot of people run things like, like, like I did, you know, I chose to run something and I connected it to something bigger than me and I was unprepared physically for it. And I like the rules apply, you know, mm -hmm. I paid the price for that for a couple months and mm -hmm. it was a price I was willing to pay. And saying that I would not pay that again. Yeah. You know, I'm going to set that trajectory a little bit longer so that I don't, it don't wreck my system for, Mm. months and months afterwards you know, hopefully <laughs> this but. is this is going to seem like a random connection but when you're talking about running it makes me think about how people think that they can do stand-up comedy because they see something that's 
a pedestrian act, like talking to people and making other people laugh. And then you see that person on stage and you think, oh, I could do that. They're, mm-hmm. they're talking. People are laughing. You know, I've told funny jokes before. I'm going to get on stage <laughs> and I'll be a stand up comic. And same thing with running. You long distance runners aren't doing anything that a normal person can't do for short periods mm-hmm. of time. And Kinda that's like, such a draw to it. Yeah. You know? Like you look at it and you're like, well, I could do that. Like I, yeah. like, like the act of running, like we can all run to our car if we really needed to. So it's mm-hmm. just, it's so human that like we can do it. You know, we tell stories, everyone tells stories to one another. Mm-hmm. Everybody's gotten a laugh out of somebody. Yeah. You know? And you're like, well, fuck, I could do that. Right. Yeah. And you see, like you see someone tell a joke on stage and you're like, oh, I could be funny for five minutes. Or you see someone running and you think I could do that until you actually try to do it and you realize how much shit goes into it how much shit goes into just running one mile correctly or one lap around the track or making someone laugh for five minutes and not bombing in a fucking short ass set like all, all the things that go into things that seem pedestrian but when you get down to it it's because those people have put in the work and they're so good that they make it seem pedestrian yeah and, yeah, yeah, and yeah. they and there's a lot of shit that goes on behind the scenes where they're putting in the work they're doing the reps things aren't all pretty and then they come out and run the, the 200 mile race the 50 mile race they come out put an hour netflix special and you're like oh like that doesn't seem that hard well and i love it too with it's you know Overnight success, man. Mm-hmm. Two know? chains. It took me ten years to be an overnight success. Yep, yep. I, I love that shit. I got a. Uh, I think I'll, I'll always embrace like the underdog mentality type thing. You know, like a little bit of the chip on my shoulder type type mentality. And and I I think a healthy amount of that is really good for people. I think a lot of people take it too far, and I certainly in my past have taken it too far and embraced that way too wholeheartedly Mm -hmm. you know and i found a lot of balance and a lot of joy in in that balance but i I think that the you know that underdog mentality that kind of chip on my shoulder mentality it can be so helpful for people and it can really pull people out of dark spots and dark places Mm -hmm. um you know and, and it's a great motivator kind of forgot where I was going with that but that ended up being a perfect transition because what I wanted to get into was story work awesome and speaking of pulling people out of dark places hence the perfect transition (laughs) I want to get into story work and, and what a story means and what you're doing now which is workyourstories.com yeah Dave Robinson And before we get into this, I want to say that since we've been talking about working your stories in an official matter, I realized that since we've met four or five years back, however long it's been, you've been helping me work on my stories even before you started this business, whether you realize it or not. And I'm I'm sure you realize it. It was just me taking it in and then now seeing how you're turning it into a business where I'm like, oh, shit, like we've been doing this on the phone or in person every so often for the past four or five years. Right. And me having some dilemma that I can't figure out. And then you saying, okay, you know, let's break this down. What, what are you assuming that's not true? What stories yeah. are you telling yourself? So for people that are not familiar with story work, what is the basis of, of story work and, and why should we be doing it? we all use words, right? And, you know, those words create, help us create meaning. And, you know, we've, we've developed a language out of our words and we've developed, you know, these vibrations that come out of our vocal cords, like, like illicit feelings and emotions. Mm -hmm. and, And most of us have very little awareness of the actual words that we use and even less awareness of the impact that they have on us. And when one examines the actual like words that are coming out of your mouth, right? That would maybe come out of your hand onto the page or the words that are bouncing around in, in, in between your ears and your brain that you don't verbalize, right? That voice that you hear you Mm -hmm. thinking, right? Those are words. I'm talking about the same thing here. Those are all synonymous, 
Like the, the words that we use create the stories that we tell ourselves, right? Uh, our perception of the world, how we view ourselves in the world, in the world around us. Um, and, and those stories become our, our truth. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, re, the phrase perception is reality, right? Like, like if I think, you know, if the word, if the actual words, ah, oh, I'm such a fucking idiot come out of my mouth, you know, in conjunction to, mm-hmm. you know, Oh, I forgot my phone in the car. <laughs> I'm such a fucking idiot. Yeah. And, like me saying that, like I, I just now, I just felt like a, like a little like buzz, like a little like pop in my sternum yeah. of like, like, dude, you shouldn't say that shit. You know what that means? Yeah. Like, like I, because I have the awareness of simply in a joking manner saying that about myself, that's a check in the wrong fucking box of how I view myself and how I want to carry myself mm-hmm. and how I actually carry myself. And I've found that story work is the through line between all other aspects of health and wellness and personal development. The words you use about yourself internally and externally, and then how one uses language, you know, as simple as, um, in a gym, the example of saying, you know, you're on set three rep five, you're struggling. It's starting to get hard. You, this, your body gives you those signals yeah. you were talking about earlier. And I, I'm your coach and I say, don't stop, don't stop, don't stop. And like, oh, all right, maybe you get six, maybe you mm-hmm. get seven, maybe you get eight. Don't stop, Zach. Don't stop. Mm-hmm. Maybe you get 10, but it's hard, right? If that cue is keep going, because now the emphasis is on what I want you to do, right? When words come out of my mouth, that's what I want you to do, right? And so mm-hmm. I'm saying, don't stop. You're going to think about stop. If I say, keep going, you're going to think about that. Mm-hmm. And I, guarantee you you're going to hit 10 you might hit 11 12 15 if, if i'm like, yeah Zach, keep going keep yeah. going right and that's super simplistic it's not applicable to all scenarios but story work you know is diving into the language that we use on a regular basis how we use that language and then how we apply that language to the things that we've experienced like things in our past things that have quote unquote happened to us and then what we want to create moving forward mm-hmm. and so the things that happen to us um uh, create you know we create memories and 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 stories behind this experience or these experiences especially if they're hurtful or traumatic or Mm -hmm. whatever it is and we replay you know those things that happen mean that we we uh create this identity around something that happened you know and now you're the person that dot 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 or because of x you abc yeah right and most of the time that no longer serves us or there are instances where that no longer serves us or it hurts us. And so story work is the act of going in there, figuring out what that is, unwinding that fuck. And, yeah. and then that creates the space to, you know, for me or a coach or another coach to help someone move into what they want to do, which is probably the story work you kind of were alluding to in the mm-hmm. fact of what we've done. Like we've done a lot of goal setting. We've done a lot of like future casting is what mm-hmm. I call that. Or, you know, like, like building out a future. Yeah. Right. And we, and we always get on the topic of dating and relationship stuff. Cause we, we've both been on our, our separate journeys of moving through the, the dating world yeah. and, and something that you've made clear to me repeatedly is that often I'm working on the framework of a false story where, mm-hmm. where I will say this isn't going to happen or I know she's going to say this or this situation isn't going to work out for whatever reason. And then you'll stop me and say, well, did she say that? Right. And I'm like, no. And then you make the point saying, okay, you're working on, you're building a story for yourself and you're on this runway that doesn't exist. You've created this story that you are now going to base your decisions off of that. There's no evidence for and so you have to like yeah. rewind like you said like crank back and rewind and get back to okay what what is what is actually happening what what is actually living and in the present what are we doing yeah exactly and then the further step is finding out like why that occurred in the past yeah. like what happened to so that that experience or what happened so that now you expect mm-hmm. you know xyz to happen in your current situation you yeah. know, and then untying that knot, you know, I, kind of allows you to actually let it go, you know, like, like without the, 
the uh, the actual like physical weight of it. Mm-hmm. You know, like a, a emotional burden is a fucking burden. You might as well mm-hmm. have a weight vest on or bricks on your back or something. You know, and, and letting people free themselves of that is 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 powerful. And then you can recognize it sooner. I I've yeah. found myself being able to to better recognize because of our conversations. Okay this this is just a story i'm i'm telling myself there mm-hmm. there's there's no evidence for this that this person didn't say this this didn't even happen yet i'm i'm worrying and waiting about something that i've created so i need to get back to that present moment e- even just and i just said it even saying words like just mm-hmm. i i just want to talk to you why mm-hmm. didn't I say I want to talk to you? Because I'm using the just as a qualifier because if that person says no, I'll feel better about it because I said I just want to talk to you. So it doesn't mean as much to me. But if I say I want to talk to you, then that makes me feel more direct and powerful. And rejection seems worse the more you put yourself out there. So mm-hmm. it's like you're qualifying yourself with the just. Yeah, that's soft talk. You know. Yeah. Uh, I think maybe one day it would be kind of good for me to probably go to the gym. Maybe, you know, mm-hmm. like some version of that, right? Mm-hmm. Any one of those words is considered soft talk, you mm-hmm. know, and re- simply removing soft talk from the equation or replacing that, translating it to include solid talk, you know, uh, that's a simple, simple switch people can do in order to progress their learning or progress their language, right? You know, um, the word, but, you know, uh, Hey Zach, you're a great guy, but, dot dot mm-hmm. dot the word but completely negates the fact that zach is a great guy yeah you know and i'm, and <laughs> right, I'm a great right. guy <laughs> yeah, you're a great but you know you're such an asshole when yada yada whereas if it's like zach's a great guy and like you're such an asshole when dot 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 mm-hmm. it doesn't negate the fact that you're a great guy it's just yeah. an additional thing right and so it, there's so many examples of how that language you know just language that is learned you know we can unlearn those patterns and we can mm-hmm. unlearn those things and what I love about what the, what the quarantine, you know, this kind of COVID environment has done for my, my coaching practice is it's forced us to go remote in many ways. And now I can pull up a Google doc and I'll, you know, I'll, I'll type out what people actually say. And they have no idea that those words just came out of their mouth. Mm-hmm. They're like, Whoa, I said that, you know, and, and it, it can be super simple, but you know, people use negations a lot, you know, anything with an N apostrophe T is a negation, right? You know, and that's mm-hmm. a, typically an emphasis on something you don't want right? Or something negative, right? And so learning, pointing out those negations and putting it into the affirmation or what you want to have happen, right? You know, the, the story work process itself is a four step process. And, and in that process, what we're doing is we're, we're changing people's relationship to the physiological state that they're in when they're remembering something or experiencing something. And so a lot of times, if you have a, a, an emotional experience or a traumatic experience, you know, the memory comes up and you shove it back down, right? And most people haven't written down these specific things, you know, and so we'll title it and we'll write and we'll have, I'll have them write it down, right. Or type it out, you know, so that's a big win first and foremost. Mm-hmm. Like there's this thing, I'm no longer ignoring it. I've given it a name and I put it on paper, right. So typically people have not done that. Uh, the next step is to then read it out loud. And most of the time then what happens is, is okay. Like, all right, well, I can talk about it. I've told this, I've told this story before to whomever, right and they gloss over it, right? Well, that next step is to read it at 70% speed. And so now those things that they glossed over, that it's just part of their story that they're not actually thinking about, by slowing down their rate of speech, that slows down their breath. And now, you know, I can get, we can get people to drop into, you know, from this, this fight or flight, you know, uh, fight or freeze sympathetic nervous system state, you can actually a feel that as opposed to numb it over or mm-hmm. ignore it or B potentially even drop into that parasympathetic nervous system state that rest and relax feed and breed, you know, that, that, that processing state. And so people are, 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 uh, you know, maybe reliving this experience or, or going through this experience, but they're doing it in a way that they've never, uh, in a state, in a physiological state where they've never experienced it before, you know, they're going through this trauma, but they're in a calm state talking Mm -hmm. about it right and then we get them to breathe in between and the breaths volume in length out that's the meat of the entire equation is where you know you say you know in september of 2019 i was kidnapped by 
my ex-boyfriend. You know, and then you dive into that whole story and it turns this like this, you know, whatever the situation is into something that you can actually process, you know, and, and there's a phrase that we, we like to use where uh, pepper burns twice. You know, you eat something really spicy. It's not just going to be spicy one time. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be spicy that second time on the way, way out. The way in, the way yeah, out. Yeah, exactly. And if you let it inside of you and if you keep it inside of you, it'll burn you up, you know, and so you got to be able to, to let it out. Uh, and that's a, the beautiful thing about story work because, you know, the, the unofficial fifth step of the story work process and, and what I really love to do with the, and what makes the Google Doc so beautiful here is once you separate all that out, you're, that individual is breathing slower, they're in a different state, they've processed this a little bit differently, then we translate all those words, mm-hmm. like the, the how it made them feel and what they experienced. You know, I felt shame or I felt betrayal or like whatever it is. You know, we turn those into affirmations. We turn those into positives. So instead of feeling this, how do you want to feel? I want to feel that. All right, great. And then that becomes the shit that you rep on a regular basis. Mm-hmm. That becomes your AM, PM affirmations. And so you take this fucked up thing that happened or this thing that really affected you or that you haven't gotten over or whatever it may be, and that becomes the source of your greatest strength and and kind of boost moving forward and where you want to go. And it's a really empowering experience for people. For someone who may be skeptical of story work, and there was a time in my life where if I was presented with the concept of story work, I would have said, this sounds like complete bullshit. I I don't need story work in my life. And I'm lucky that I've come across information that's changed my mind. I've spoken to people like you. I've made changes in my mindset that is, has made me open to ideas like story work that may not be mainstream or may be thought of as pussy shit or mm-hmm. abnormal, things like that. What would you say to someone who had that mentality and was skeptical of story work to bring them closer back to how it is that you view it? You can run all the miles, you can drink all the, or drink all the water, eat all the kale, but if you don't love who you are inside and if you talk shit about yourself to yourself, you are going nowhere and you're going to, or you're going to stay where you are or it's going to be that much harder. You're uphill and wearing lead boots, you know, and that's why I call it a through line. Like, like, you know, what my, what my coaching consisted of before was a lot of mindset work and, and future oriented stuff. And mm-hmm. I never really dug into the past. Right. Um, and that's why I love this story work concept because I, I've layered on focusing on mentality and, you know, here are your sleep habits and hacks and tricks and, you know, here's nutrition for health and nutrition for performance. And here's, you know, I can write exercise programs all day long for people and for whatever the fuck you want to do. Mm-hmm. And, you know, but you know, those healthy holistic habits are nothing without a solid foundation of your internal dialogue Mm -hmm. and your internal dialogue is a, you know, or your external dialogue is a direct reflection of your internal dialogue and, you know, changing, helping to change people's states or at least bring people the awareness of their physiological state through an awareness of breath, through an awareness of words. Like it is profoundly fucking life changing dude. Mm -hmm. And, and it is a, you know, my, very, very dear friend and mentor, Mark England has, has turned this into a process It's a process and you can follow the fucking process and it, it's, it's a blueprint, you know, and, and, and it makes all the other healthy things that you're doing work better because you've focused on the actual vessel itself. Like you've the internal shit, like this is almost like a spirit, like mm-hmm. soul type shit. Right. And because you focus, because you know, that has now been addressed because I now love myself. Like it makes everything else so much better because I love myself. I'm going to drink the water, you know, because I love myself. I'm not going to do two shitty days in a row, you know, because I love myself. I'm going to do hard things and I'm going to do it consistently. And until I, until I really examined that, you know, and, and why I didn't love myself and Mm -hmm. what I had to let go of in order to love myself, and what I had to forgive myself for in order to love myself, right? Like until I did that, all the other shit just, was just wasn't working. Like I was like still getting hurt and still unhappy, and you know yada yada yada. And 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 it is just such a freeing feeling to, you know, and it's not all about like I mean that sounds you know pussy shit, right? You know, mm-hmm. but at the same time, like like 
I really love the concept behind what Tim Ferriss has done with, you know, tribe of mentors and tool of Titans and like, you know, what, what you're doing with podcasts. It's like interview rad motherfuckers in their field and figure out what makes them tick and like Mm -hmm. why that is, you know, and 80% of Tim's guests were into meditation. So, yeah. Oh, holy shit. Lo and behold, this might have and something think, fucking to okay, it. Okay. Yeah. Right? Maybe, <laughs> maybe meditation is something I should get yeah, into. If it works for l- this list of people, it's got to work for old Dave, you know, or old Zach, you know, regular old Dave. Right. And you know, I, as again, as cliche as it sounds like doing the inner work leads to the greatest amount of freedom that I've experienced. And then I've been able to, uh, see and help facilitate in certain people so having just listened to that your balls and lady parts are probably tingling right now (laughs) so so where can people find you at to get into working their stories with you and how how can they do that yeah Um, you can find me online at workyourstories.com and I've got a booking link on there happy to do a a call with you to, to learn a little bit more about you know, what it is that you think is holding, you know, what you think it is that's holding you back and, and, you know, see where that conversation leads us. Um, online, you can find me at get strapped, stay strapped, which is my, uh, my old company. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and the current mantra, it's the current motto. Yeah. Current and motto. It'll it's always a be the motto. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Um, you know, and, and, uh, I think I'm going to keep that Instagram handle for a while. So keep it. Yeah. So I think a, a good spot to end off at, and this is a selfish spot for me too, is can you talk about a positive experience that you've had with weed or psychedelics? Because as someone who is getting back into smoking weed on a more regular basis and has been anxious about it in the past, yeah. and someone who's getting ready to jump into psychedelics at my own pace and who, if you're listening to this and you've done psychedelics, you haven't done psychedelics, it's personal to you. But for me, I tend to run more negative when I think about those things and I hear the stories that of things that have gone wrong yeah. and there is a risk involved with any drug it, that you take. Can you talk about a positive experience or an experience that stands out with either weed or psychedelics sure. that change the way that you think about things? Yeah, great question. Um, you know, first of all, I love this mantra. I have this mantra from my buddy, Brian Mucha. Uh, I took a medicine and the medicine is working. And I have been in a combo experience, you know, which again is not a hallucinogenic or psychedelic, mm-hmm. but just a like, you know, in the shit and just, I took a medicine, the medicine is working. I took a medicine, the medicine is working. And, and I have not personally had that much experience with psychedelics, um, you know, and so thus I have not personally had a negative trip. Right. I've had a lot of, or a couple of beautiful experiences with psilocybin, you know, magic mushrooms, where it, which mm-hmm. has led me to be very, very connected to my natural world and the world around me and to other people, um, change and alter my perception of time and space and how those things interact and um, open my mind to the idea that, you know, there are no such, or um, rather, things do not happen in opposition to nature merely to an opposition of what we know about nature, which is a, a Saint, a rough St. Augustine quote. Um, you know, but in light of my lack of experience in those, I'd love to talk about cannabis because mm-hmm. I, uh, am of very course. well versed in, yes. <laughs> in pre, 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 yes, preach the, preach the word yes, of yes. cannabis, the, 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 the healing, le- healing yes. of the nations. Um, you know, and, and this is a, I don't, necessarily know why or I have maybe some ideas of why this is such an important topic to me and you know I haven't talked a ton publicly about it but um, you know alcohol is such a prevalent drug in our society that it's so prevalent that I I believe and this is unofficial but poll a hundred people and you know maybe 10 of those people will actually call alcohol a drug Mm mm-hmm right? No, it's just a drink. It's a substance. It's a thing. You know, it's so prevalent in college societies. It's wrapped around sports, yeah, it's work, everywhere. everywhere. Right. And the reality of the situation is it's a, it's a poison. And, you know, it, you know, I'm, I'm saying this on the tail end of drinks in the teens last night, teens in number <laughs> from my best friend and college roommates yeah. uh, wedding, you know, and 
at the same time, I can count on one hand the amount of times I've drank this year, this calendar year, you know, in August now, because uh, I know that it is a poison to your body. Like, you know, people die of drinking too much. People die of drinking and driving. People ruin their fucking lives over alcohol, and, and I've seen it happen. Uh, people lose their inhibitions. They do dumb shit. Um, you know, there is a... Um, I think we've all been around or know people who have had very negative experiences with people with alcohol or gotten into fights or, you know, God forbid, maybe uh, sexual violence or things mm-hmm. of that nature. And, and it's just not like that with cannabis. Like when you smoke weed, like y- you still stay within yourself. You mm-hmm. don't lose your inhibitions. You, you drive slower, Right, more paranoid, <laughs> you know, more yeah. fucking paranoid, right? Like you, you know, you love more, you laugh more, you vibe more with people, and and cannabis has helped open up myself to to myself. And I think one of the things that people get paranoid about with with weed, especially or cannabis, especially, is when, in my experience, and the experience of so many people, when when you smoke and you're not living in congruence with who you really are weed will point that shit out real quick. Mm-hmm. Like you'll start thinking about that thing that you did or what you've been doing or that thing you said, you know, and, and you don't want to hurt anybody on, you know, when you're, when you're, when you're yeah, smoking, it, you it know brings out, yeah, your, it your brings out that kindness, yeah. pacifist, kind, exactly. kind persona. And, and so I've got a buddy, Angelo Cisco, who's got a company. I almost wore the shirt today. It, it's, it's alpha hippie, right? That's his company, mm-hmm. alpha hippie. And I fucking love that because I will throw down, and be a fucking savage with anybody. And 99% of the time, like I'm going to be kind and, and loving and empathetic. And I think that's the way that men should be, you know, Mm -hmm. and I think that's the the mold that men can find themselves in and, and change the world in by adopting that more divinity or, uh, um, you know, feminine divine, um, femininity, right? Like, like be a fucking savage, be an animal in the gym, but sprinkle that shit. Like you don't mm-hmm. need that shit all the time. Like you should marinate in kindness, Yeah. you know? And, and I, that's what cannabis will do versus something like alcohol. So if it's having a choice, like, um, oh, you know, like libation of choice for your teenage daughter. Yeah. Have her smoke weed and stay on the couch, you know, as opposed to drink and go out. Right. Yeah. In my experience, alcohol has been the gateway drug for me every single new drug that i've tried i've been drunk it's because your inhibitions have been down yeah. and you know? when i'm high i've never wanted to or have tried another drug when i'm high mm-hmm. maybe, if, maybe if i'm drinking first and i smoke a little weed i'll have alcohol and weed in my system but for the most part i'm when i'm not in the throes of a panic attack <laughs> which has happened a few times I've had many positive experiences with weed. I just want to make that clear. I feel connected. I feel kind. Yeah. I feel like my mind is exploring things. Like you said, that may be off kilter. It points those things out in your life. And weed is a drug that I want to be part of my life and get better at consuming, to be honest. Yeah. Because I know that when I do have those, when I do have those freak outs, there is something that I'm not in touch with. There's something that I'm avoiding. And for you, you may, it, y- your life may be better without weed. That's personal for yeah. you. If, if it's a, you always have to think about what's the net positive of doing a drug. And for me, even though I've had freak outs, weed has been a net positive in my life. I've come to many spiritual that sound, sounds cliche, but things that I've realized when I've been high or ways, conversations that I've had that I would have never had had I not been in that state. And that has outweighed all the bad experiences that I've had on weed, the, the ones where I really felt in touch with people. I was walking around the city high yeah. during the day and I'm just feeling connected or I'm in nature yep. and just that connection that you feel that I haven't felt on other drugs like alcohol that are there. I would wager marijuana is a net positive for the vast majority of people out there. And, you know, I think it's also to point out dosage, right? Mm-hmm. You know, that's, for, yeah, for that's inexperienced thing, yeah. people, it's really, you know, like, uh, you think of like, Oh, like just smoking weed is like one dose. And mm-hmm. you know, the cannabis strains are different. You know, there's two major strains, Tiva and Indica. One's kind of like a upper, yeah, mental. The other's like a yeah. body, like a down chill, 
right? Mixing those at the wrong time, like that, you, that could send you in a bad way. And, you know, if you take three bong rips of a high THC, you know, uh, uh, cannabis, or you smoke yeah. a whole joint and you haven't smoked since you were, you know, 22 years old, now you're in your fifties. Cause you heard the Auxero podcast. Like that's the yeah. equivalent of going into, you know, a bar and ordering the bottle of tequila and drinking the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, like you would take a shot or have a drink or have a sip or have a beer. Like, you know, I think it's really important for people who are new to, you know, cannabis or who want to experiment with it uh, or have limited experience with it is, is to remember the dosage. Like think mm-hmm. about it from a drink perspective. Like you'd like to have like two glasses of wine and you're okay, but four and you're taking your top off dancing on the table. Like, yeah, you know, cannabis won't make you do either, but air on the side of a quarter of the joint versus roasting the whole fucking thing. And you will have a different experience between those two amounts. Yeah. And now that we is becoming legal in more places, people can actually figure out what they want, the strain, yes. the, the dosage. And they can take it in edible form, which is a great for a lot take of Take it in edible form. Yeah. Whereas before, I, I don't ask what I'm smoking in college. I don't ask how much it is. There was a point where before I had my first panic attack on weed, I was taking the milkiest bong rips and being high as fuck. And it wasn't even a thought in my mind that a panic attack was a possibility for me until I had one. And then I realized how much I was not respecting the drug. And now with people being able to order what they want, the dosage, the strain and having things that vibe with them, it would be like if I walked into a bar and the bartender said, what do you want? And I said, alcohol. And he'd be yeah. like, what are you talking, like what? Like right. what type of drink do you want? If, if you walked into a dispensary and you've never thought about what strain or what dosage or how you want to take it, oils, hash, edibles, there's all these options now that that's like alcohol where you can yeah. find something you want and you say, oh, I have a vodka soda with lime or... And you can you mix know, and match and there's a time and a place too, yeah. you know, which is cool. And, yeah. and, you know, if you get to the point where you can kind of like pick that out, you know, like I, I know that, you know, if I have a whiskey ginger, like I got to do that after the speech. You know, I can't have whiskey mm-hmm. gingers be- before the toast. You know, I got to yeah. do that after the toast. Yeah. You know? But I can have two beers before the toast and like be all right. Yeah. You know? they're, like, they're the drinks that you're sipping right. and, the, and the drinks, <laughs> and drinks where that you're, you're chugging. you know... <laughs> I'm going to go 13 deep on a wedding night and come back and crush a fucking podcast yeah. the, the next afternoon. So there, there's di- the different styles of smoking or different styles of drinking. And I think it's important to have the context of, of, you know, and this is similar to like, uh, it goes back to language, you know, like, Oh, I had a cheat meal. You know, I cheated on my diet, right? Like I cheated or, or whatever it is. Like I like to use the phrase of myself and with my clients that, that we chose entertainment. Like last night was so guilt free for me, you know, even mm-hmm. though I don't drink a lot and, and, and my diet's pretty on point. Like, like I had, I went back and got seconds on wedding cake, mm-hmm. you know, like, like no doubt, yeah. you know, and, 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 but last night because I chose entertainment, I was able to lean into that and embrace it and be mm-hmm. present with the fact that tonight I'm going to drink and, mm-hmm. and it's a conscious choice. It's a conscious decision. I consciously understand that tomorrow morning might be no bueno mm-hmm. and still, you know, be okay with that because I chose it as opposed yeah. to having it just be like a, a random act or just out of habit or whatever it is. And I think that's an important distinction. That's the thing that sports and meditation and just working out in general or doing hard things to bring it full circle yeah. back to back to the beginning of the podcast that having discipline is a more fun than being undisciplined because I never feel guilty about eating the crap meal because I know 99.9% of the time I'm eating the same exact thing, which is relatively healthy. I, I don't feel guilty about going out to drink once every few months getting fucking trashed with mm-hmm. my buddies because discipline is something that is an anchor and I, and I don't feel I would feel more guilty about doing things if I was doing it on a regular basis. If I was constantly eating like shit or constantly going out and drinking, I would mm-hmm. wake up questioning my life all the time. It's been a really long time since I've gotten fucked up or ate a bad meal where I question my decision because I knew going into that, that this is not the type of person I am. This is a break from the things that I'm normally doing. And then the next day I'm getting back on or next week or next month, depending on your 
time frame for recovery, things like that. Every, yeah. Everything's different. So discipline is fucking fun. You have more fun when you're disciplined because you don't feel guilty about the shit that you do when you're saying taking a slight detour. Yeah, Jocko yeah. Willing, discipline is freedom. You know, yeah, and it's you know being being in that mindset or, or having that that mindset, being in that space of of choosing it gives you that freedom like you said you know because you you you're choosing you're living on purpose and a lot of us live on autopilot a lot of us live on autopilot Mm -hmm. and you know choosing to live on purpose deciding to live on purpose means that you're taking things off of autopilot and examining why you do things and figuring out whether it's working for you or not or whether it's leading you to where you want to go and deciding to deciding to work on yourself is a, is that first big step. And then you get mm-hmm. to choose what you want to keep, what you don't like, what you want to add in, what you want to make different. You and I are going to talk a little bit about what you're eating on a regular basis and yeah, off air. We'll do that. We'll do that. You can, you can <laughs> totally, lean into me. Totally cool. I'll lean into you a little yeah. bit closer. Uh, but no, it's, it's, it's choosing, you know, choosing yourself and your future. And, and Mac- Matthew McConaughey has a great like acceptance speech. It's, really really awesome you should look it up online if you're listening to this and and it's something along the lines of like he was asked who his hero is and he's like oh, my hero is myself in 10 years and you know then you know at that age you know it's 20 to 30 30 the same person asked him who's your hero oh, my, myself in 10 years you know and, and i fucking love that concept man because it's like when i look at myself as a 22 year old like 10 years ago when i look at myself five years ago as a 27 year old I'm so fucking proud of myself for mm-hmm. where I'm at now and knowing how much more I have to go and how many other things I want to do and, and, you know, knowing where I stand in the grand scheme of things, like I ain't still ain't shit, you know? And, and I think it's important to have that, like we're little specks in the universe. Yeah. Like we don't fucking matter, you know, but we do. Right. And, yeah. and I just think it's, it's rad to look at it that way. Well, Dave fucking Robinson, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure, my friend. At Get Strapped Days. At Get Strapped, Stay Strapped, workyourstories.com, and I'll link all this in the podcast description, wherever you're listening to it, on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, wherever, all this will be linked, and thanks again for for stopping by, and thank you, bro, and recording this beautiful conversation. All love, man. Thanks, y'all. All love.